a good friend of mine, Micah Crawford, sent me the coordinates to what I believe are a couple of lost graves just outside of Bryceland in Bienville Parish. Now these are supposed to be back in the woods somewhere, so we're gonna have to search for these, I'm sure. Now I don't have some sort of a macabre obsession or fascination with old graves, not at all. I'm working with the state archeologist to properly document these graves so that they'll be preserved for future generations. And so logging crews will be made aware of them so they won't destroy them when they're harvesting timber. Now I don't have anything at all against logging crews or loggers or the industry at all. But if they don't know that the graves are there, they're not gonna know to take measures to protect them. Let's see if we can find these graves. According to the GPS coordinates, this is as close as we can get to the graves in a vehicle. We're gonna have to walk in the woods from now and see if we can track these down. There should be two graves if I understood right. And luckily the woods don't appear to be too thick, so it shouldn't be that hard uh, looking around in the woods. Let's go. Let's take a look. Let's go this way. This is where the GPS is leading us. According to the coordinates, we should be real close. The only thing about searching for graves that have been here for a while is they could be covered with leaves or it looks like somebody's used a, something to push up the ground around here. One of my biggest fears about finding old graves is they may have been pushed over during the logging industry. Because the timber crews a lot of times have no idea that there's an old cemetery in the area. It's really pretty and peaceful out here. I see here's a flat spot. Oh, look there. I'm just scanning this area. I don't see any real large old trees so that's not going to help us very much Somebody's put up a flag here. 
Let's see. Oh, and this right here, I don't know if you can see this very well in the camera. There's a terrace row. They would have done that, of course, to keep the water from washing the soil down, down the hill. Let's just take a look here and see if we can see what that ribbon is here to mark. I don't see a thing yet. I hope you heard that. That was the call of a pileated woodpecker, the largest woodpecker species in North America, third largest woodpecker species in the world. Pileated refers to the bird's prominent red crest from the Latin pileatus, which means capped. The pileated woodpecker can reach lengths from 16 to 19 inches with a wingspan between 26 and 30 inches. Cartooner Walter Lance is believed to have based the appearance of his creation, Woody Woodpecker, on the Pileated Woodpecker. Now those graves should be in this area somewhere. Where there are humans, there is trash. A rule of life. more terrace rows. That leads me to believe that on this hill there was crop growing of some sort. They don't normally do that for pine trees, so that would be, I would assume, cotton or staple grains or something like that. Another terrace row. So we're in a line of terrace rows here. Well, it's a nice walk right here. Be right over there somewhere. We're still real close with our GPS coordinate. So we should, if they're here, we should see them just any minute now. <clears throat> The way I normally search for these is in a, a zigzag pattern and out here I have zigged and zagged and have come up empty so far. Never give up, never surrender. I'm just gonna look into the woods to the left. This is where, according to the GPS, the grave should be. And I've zigzagged over a, it may look like I've gone a long way I've gone a short distance, but I've walked it in a zigzag pattern. And now, we're almost back to the car. I guess we're gonna have to have a little more help. Well, looks like we may go back empty handed on this one. But I'm gonna continue to look and see if I can see anything. But we saw some pretty scenery. Well, we didn't find the graves we were after, but wait a minute. I have to show you something. Look over my shoulder. Don't know if you can see it back there, but there's a headstone. 
Now look where I'm parked. <laughs> Let's go take a look. Oh, look at this. So it's a stone marker carving on it. J.P. McCoy, born June the 15th, 1839, died May, what is that, 15th, 1895, wow. 1895. Now is this, I see another headstone here, a headstone there. Another, possibly a footstone. Let's look at this J.P. McCoy. Nothing carved on the back. This looks like Civil War Memorial. Let's see. Yes, yes. J.P. McCoy, Company E, 27th Louisiana Infantry, Confederate States of America. Let's see, I don't see. This one is pretty worn. make out anything carved on this. If there was another piece to it, it has been broken long ago. See how smooth this is? If this was a, a fresh break, you know, 10, 20 years ago, that probably would be real sharp, have sharp edges and not these smooth edges that's from weather. Let's see about this footstone. I guess it's a footstone. I would call it a footstone. I don't see any carving. What I'm gonna do is take the precise coordinates of these grays and do an outline of the area to properly record them with the state. I always feel weird about stepping over someone's grave. I'm also looking around to see if I can see any other things protruding out of the, the leaves and brush. All right, got the coordinates down. Take some pictures. We're gonna put some flags up. So next time they do a timber thinning, which is, looks like it's gonna be a long time, maybe they'll have an idea that there is something here. So we sure don't want the heavy machinery to destroy graves. Mr. McCoy, who are you? Why are you buried here? That's what we're gonna find out. Why is he buried here? Mr. McCoy. Since these graves are out in the woods, 
I'm gonna refresh this just to let people who may be searching for it I don't know where to look On June 5th, 1839, J.P. James McCoy was born in Edgefield County, South Carolina. In 1859 or 1860, James, along with his parents, brothers, and sisters, moved from South Carolina to Bienville Parish, Louisiana, a distance of about 720 miles. On June 1st, 1860, Gilbert McCoy, James's father, bought 320 acres in Bienville Parish on which to raise cotton. Remember all those terrace rows we saw? It's likely that those terrace rows were made by the McCoy family, probably with slave labor. James's father owned at least four slaves. The terrace rows were needed to decrease soil erosion and to reduce surface runoff of water. On April 12, 1861, the Civil War began when Confederate forces fired upon the Union-held Fort Sumter in Charleston, South Carolina. During the winter of 1861-1862, the Confederacy organized the 27th Louisiana Infantry Regiment. In April 1862, 23-year-old James McCoy volunteered and joined the 27th Regiment, Company E, of the Louisiana Infantry as a private. He trained at Camp Moore near Kentwood, Louisiana. Camp Moore was the principal base of operations for eastern Louisiana and southwestern Mississippi and it served as a Confederate training base. On May 1, 1862, James's regiment left Camp Moore on foot for Vicksburg, Mississippi. The distance from Camp Moore to Vicksburg was about 120 miles as the crow flies. Marching 120 miles in modern rubber-soled shoes would be a difficult task. It must have been horrendous in the 1860s. The average infantryman had leather shoes called brogans, which were described as being coarse, stout leather shoes reaching the ankle. By modern comparison, the shoes were terribly uncomfortable. The leather soles protected the wearer's foot, but there was no absorption as there is in modern rubber soled shoes. They had little or no arch support. The only thing the soldiers could do to soften each step was to add extra pairs of socks if they had them. It must have been like walking 120 miles in leather-soled cowboy boots or dress shoes with no padded insoles. It must have been brutal. On May 4th, on their fourth day of marching, the 27th Louisiana Infantry, including James McCoy, arrived in Vicksburg with aching feet. They quickly joined in the picket line that surrounded Vicksburg. This is the Vicksburg Bridge, which crosses the Mississippi River. The trip that took those marching soldiers four days to complete can now be done in a car in just over two hours. Vicksburg was the last major Confederate stronghold on the Mississippi River. The Mississippi was the lifeline of the South. As long as the Confederacy controlled the Mississippi River, its soldiers could transport goods, military supplies, and communications with ease. Whoever controlled Vicksburg controlled the Mississippi River. Confederate President Jefferson Davis said Vicksburg was the nail head that holds the South's two halves together. President Abraham Lincoln declared, Vicksburg is the key. The war can never be brought to a close until that key is in our pocket. This bend in the river is just one of the reasons why Vicksburg was so strategically important. Confederate lookouts could spot an enemy ship from a great distance and had plenty of time to fire a, a barrage of cannonballs at the ships. Occasionally, U.S. steamboats took their chances and, as they called it, ran the guns of Vicksburg. U.S. troops usually transported their goods and communications in this area by land and kept a safe distance from the gun placements here at Vicksburg. James McCoy and the other members of the 27th Louisiana Infantry had their line right across here. This is the hill that the 27th Louisiana Infantry, James McCoy's regiment, occupied.
10 days after the 27th Louisiana Infantry reached Vicksburg, Grant's army captured Jackson, Mississippi, the capital of the state. Following Grant's victory at Jackson, he led his 35,000 men toward Vicksburg. The Confederate force under John C. Pemberton numbered about 18,500 men at Vicksburg. On May 19th, Grant's army attacked the Confederate fortifications at Vicksburg, but were repelled by the Confederate soldiers. Grant's army attacked a second time on May the 22nd and were repelled yet again. Finally, on May 25th, Grant decided, as he wrote, upon a regular siege to outcamp the enemy, as it were, and to incur no more losses. The Union forces surrounded Vicksburg, dug in, and waited for Vicksburg to run out of supplies. Finally, on July 4th, 1863, after 47 long days, Pemberton surrendered. The 27th Louisiana Infantry Regiment suffered heavy losses, including both its colonel and lieutenant colonel killed while defending the city during the siege of Vicksburg. The survivors, including James McCoy, were captured when Vicksburg fell on our nation's Independence Day, the 4th of July, 1863. With the fall of Vicksburg, the Union controlled the Mississippi River and cut off Arkansas, Texas, and most of Louisiana from the Confederate States. It effectively split the Confederacy for the remainder of the war. On a side note, I need to point out that for more than 80 years after the surrender, Vicksburg did not celebrate the 4th of July. It took the patriotism following World War II and a visit from General Dwight Eisenhower for Vicksburg to begin celebrating Independence Day once again. Shortly after Vicksburg fell, General Grant paroled the soldiers because he didn't want to have to take the time to transport them back up north to prison camps, nor did he want to have to feed them. Most of the soldiers, including the 27th Louisiana Infantry, returned to their homes. James McCoy returned to what is now Bryceland, Louisiana, his home. We only know a few things about James's life after he returned home from the Civil War. By looking at this headstone, we know he died on May 15, 1895. That leaves another mystery. Whose headstone is this? On October 22, 1863, just three months after returning home, James McCoy married Caroline M. Tilly in Bienville Parish. Surprisingly, in an era when couples had several children, I could find no evidence that James and Caroline had children. In fact, census records show that James and Caroline lived alone for the rest of their lives. Based on the process of elimination, this leads me to believe that this grave must belong to James's wife, Caroline Tilly McCoy. James and Caroline's parents and other family members were buried in other local cemeteries. Now, what do we know about Caroline Tilly McCoy? Not very much. In February 1842, Caroline Tilly McCoy was born in Barber County, Alabama. Her family moved to Bienville Parish sometime between 1843 and 1849. She died on October the 2nd, 1909. Now, why were James and Caroline's headstones made of this red rock when the rest of their family members that I found had marble headstones? Her father was a doctor. Why wasn't Caroline's name carved on the rock if this is, in fact, Caroline's headstone? Was their financial situation such that they could only afford this, the cheapest of the stone markers available at the time? Did they have a falling out with their family? Are there more graves out here? We really may never know. When I began my search for these two graves, I had no idea that it would lead me to Vicksburg in the Civil War. It's amazing what we can learn from a single headstone. Did you know you can join me in the preservation of history? If we don't preserve our history, it will become truly lost. Become a member today by clicking the Join Me link in the description below. Where will our next search lead? I'm Brad Dyson. I'll see you soon.